Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Meandering Mike with me, Rob from the Geek Show Podcast Network, and my guest today is Nick Antosca. Now, uh, some of you may like American Horror Story, some of you may like Stranger Things, some of you may even like some other strange supernatural horror cult TV show of some sort. But if you've never watched Channel Zero, then you are seriously missing out. Nick, tell us all about Channel Zero. Channel Zero is our uh, psychological horror anthology show. airs on a sci-fi channel in the U.S. It's based on creepypasta stories, which are online urban legends, basically. And each season is a totally different story. They're all uh, really disturbing and strange. What is a creepypasta? Is it like those old Victorian horror pulp stories that you used to get? Um, not really. I mean, I would say they're, they're like, uh, the closest thing you can compare them to really is urban legends. Um, they're written by anyone, anywhere, like anybody can write a creepypasta and then they post it online either in the, um, the, the official creepypasta forum or in like Reddit, no sleep or really just anywhere. Um, and then, the most uh, disturbing ones, the most memorable ones, tend to go viral. And they develop a following of their own. People do fan fiction based on them. Uh, they write uh, unauthorized sequels, sometimes even create unauthorized video games based on them. Um, and our show, in a way, is is kind of uh, a fan fiction of creepypastas. I and mean, I think of every season of Channel Zero as like a nightmare that we have after reading the original story that it's based on. Ah, so it's a bit like the whole Slenderman thing that went around then. Exactly. Slenderman is probably the best-known creepypasta. It's just an idea or an image that took hold in people's minds and spread. And Candle Cove is another one. That's our first season. No End House, our second season, which is airing now in the U.S., is another one. Um, and there's there's thousands and thousands of Okay, fantastic. So I've got to, I've got to say, Candle Cove, uh, the actual kids show is highly, highly disturbing. It reminds me of the kids shows that I grew up with during the uh, late seventies and hmm. early eighties. Like what? What were some? What What did you watch that uh, that stuck with you? The, because this is a common thing among viewers of the show and um, and people of our generation. The early movement stuff, right? Right, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We watched a bunch of stuff uh, in preparation for making our version of the show. You know, Peppermint Park, a lot of weird stuff out of Eastern Europe, uh, a lot of stuff out of the UK, um, and uh, all that stuff. You know, uh, somebody thought that up and put it on the on the air for kids to watch, and it some some of those images like burrow into your brain and stay there. Yeah. I mean, when I was watching the uh, the um, at the end of the uh, DVD, you have like uh, right. all of them in a row. All of the all the uh, Candle Cove episodes, yeah, yeah, those were fun to shoot. Um, they were they were created. You know, we tried to be really faithful to Chris Straub's mm-hmm. description of uh, of the puppet show in his his original story, and we had a guy named Rob Mills out of Canada. And his team build all the puppets and, and recreate the little shows. They, they operate the puppets. They do the voices. So we spent uh, a day or two just just recreating that show, which is like kind of surreal. You're just like hanging around with, you know, 50 guys on a soundstage, like playing with puppets. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've got to admit, I found some of the Candle Cove stuff gave me flashbacks of stuff I watched years ago from the Key Brothers who did mm-hmm. some very, very disturbing puppetry things. Yeah, I mean, if we were to if we were to do that, like, that would almost be too disturbing. You wouldn't be able to believe, like, oh, that, that's a plausible kids' show. So in recreating the Candle Cove show, we had to, like, find a balance between um, – it had to be, like, creepy and disturbing and unsettling, but also, like, just, like, public accessy enough that it could plausibly have been a real thing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I get that. It's that fine line. I think, uh, the, the dark crystal is the one that springs to mind that kind of sits firmly on that line. Sure. Labyrinth. Yeah. Yeah. All the Jim Henson stuff. Actually, um, uh, uh, Brian Henson at the Jim Henson company referred us to, 
um, to Rob Mills uh, because we were we were just looking around for like who were the most experienced uh, puppeteers. Fantastic. So uh, I've got to ask, how difficult then? Um, we've talked about a little bit about Candle Cove as the kids show, but how difficult is it to put together a show like Channel Zero Candle Cove? In theory, it should be very difficult because it's really hard to get any show on the air. I mean, that's what, uh, as, you know, TV writers, storytellers, producers that in, um, in the entertainment industry spend years trying to get shows on the air. Uh, but Channel Zero was, um, you know, I was lucky. Uh, we, uh, we went in at the right time. We pitched it at the right time. Um, people were interested in anthology shows and we went to sci-fi, uh, at, at a really good time and found really supportive partners there. Um, so this show got sold as a pitch in the spring of 2015. I wrote the pilot in the summer of 2015 and we were greenlit in the fall and on the air a year later. And that's, you know, that's, that's pretty fast. That is a very Um, quick turnaround. So, Sometimes it just kind of comes together. Okay, and you've got some amazing child actors in Channel Zero. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, the, some of the some of the kids you've got playing the roles are amazing. Yeah, they're all local kids from Winnipeg. We shoot the show in Manitoba, um, uh, right outside of Winnipeg, in Canada, and um, because of. Uh, you know, budget and schedule and kids hours, we had to hire local kids. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so we just did a, a big casting call and like, um, Luca, who plays the twins, uh, Abby Panowski, who plays Mike's daughter. These are like really, really talented kids. Um, Abby is actually, she's also makes an appearance in the second season of Channel Zero, uh, No End House. Um, she's in Arrival. I think she's in a new show on ABC. She's like uh, all over the place. I love that scene with the telephone and just her staring at the pitch black mm-hmm. entryway and just the way her, you know, her voice doesn't really take on any kind of creepy overtones. It just changes and then mm-hmm. goes back to just her normal self. That's the actress, you know, like you, we, she's able to do that. Um, in every take she can she she just has like for her incredibly young age she's amazingly good and i've never really seen another kid actor do that um abby's just a natural talent so uh i mean some of the some of the other actors and actresses that you've got uh that you managed to get on board fiona shaw paul schneider um was it difficult talking them into doing the show I wouldn't say it was difficult. Um, Paul is, Paul's a very particular actor. Uh, he, you know, I think he turns down a lot and we send him the script. He loved the script. Um, but then he, you know, he was curious about like what the approach was going to be because as an actor, um, particularly an actor who, you know, could work a lot, like you're taking a risk when you sign up for a show that's like dependent on like puppets and uh, crazy like monsters and stuff, you could be signing up to make yourself look bad, you know, like it could be stupid. So, um, so he, he wanted to know like what the, what the intent was, what the tone was going to be. And uh, Craig McNeil and I talked to him, you know, a little bit and, and told him about our, um, our approach to the material, how we were going to take it seriously, what we wanted to do with his character um and uh, he was on board fantastic um okay so we need to talk about the poster boy for channel zero candle cove who is obviously tooth child mm-hmm. uh, yeah. tell me more about how tooth child came about so when we're adapting these stories i mean they're very short stories um they're 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 a seed and they're a great horror concept that we can uh, build from. So I tend to think about, you know, what are the themes of the story? Um, what does it inspire? And I just let that percolate for a while. Uh, and, and the story grows from there. And the tooth child came from a dream that I had after, uh, working on, you know, adapting the, the, the original short story that Chris wrote. And, I loved it because in addition to being 
a really jarring image um, and a disturbing concept. It's thematically tied to childhood and the loss of innocence, um, a figure made entirely of human baby teeth. Uh, it's terrifying, and it's kind of cute. And it is, actually. I'll be honest. I, I, the first time I saw Tooth Child, I kind of went, ah. And then, and then yeah, I realized just how you know, It's a matter of some dispute among viewers, but um, uh, I find it uh, kind of sweet. All I can say is, once the internet really takes hold of Tooth Child, expect a lot of fan art. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, Tooth Child has become a bit of a meme and, and pops up in, you know, in different places. Um, it's taken on a, a life of his own, really, which is, is good, is the way it should be. The thing that got me about Tooth Child, the thing that got me about the usage of teeth uh, in particular, um, I don't know if you're familiar with any books by Terry Pratchett. You know, I, of course I know who Terry Pratchett is. I don't think I've actually ever read a Terry Pratchett book. Um, one of his books is called Hogfather, and the idea in Hogfather is that assassins have been hired to kill what is effectively Santa Claus. And the way they do that is to break into the realm of the Tooth Fairy and use children's teeth to control their belief that Hogfather doesn't exist. Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. And when I saw Tooth Child and just how Tooth Child worked with Channel Zero, my immediate thought was, wow, this is, you know, this is amazing. I wonder, and I actually went to the internet to start Googling if there was actually any folklore or myths about controlling children using their <laughs> teeth. Yeah. No, it, it somehow it, uh, it just seems like elementally correct to me somehow i mean there's um you what you have to be uh rigorous with your logic when building a horror story but yeah. not too rigorous you know sometimes something just feels right or disturbing on a gut level and um i tend to just go with it yeah the other monster to use that as a loose term that uh is kind of central to Candle Cove, or to Channel Zero Candle Cove, is Skin Taker. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about the birth of Skin Taker. Where did that come from? Because that was... I found Skin Taker a lot creepier and a lot scarier than I did Tooth Child. Yeah, so, I mean, Skin Taker is in the original story. Unlike Tooth Child, we changed it a little bit because... So, in, in Chris's story, Skin Taker is the skeleton puppet with the hat. Ah. Um, in the show, but I, I was a little worried that um, that it would just seem too implausible when you actually saw it that a children's show would have something called the Skin Taker. Like it just wouldn't read as like okay, they would actually put that in a kids show. Yeah, uh, and we wanted it. We wanted the show to play as plausible, at least on, on first viewing. Um, so so we renamed it uh, with a more innocuous playful sounding name um and then we made skin the the real skin taker the true demonic uh spirit or face behind the playful facade of the show um and in the writer's room i kept saying like okay these puppets are like these playful kind of sinister yet goofy things uh so the the skin taker the thing behind them should be like tactile and and um uh, gross and it just should feel like an entirely different thing and i kept showing people the work of uh this artist olivier de sagazan who covers himself with clay and smears it all around and transforms himself into a monster just using clay and paint uh, and sticks and stuff like that and finally we were like well, why don't we just call him up and see if he'll do it and uh, and he did, and so we flew him over from France, and he played the skin taker as uh, the personification of a child's rage. Wow! Yeah, and he's um, he's a, a really fascinating, interesting guy. You know, you talk to him about his art, and he will. Uh, and English is not his first language, but he'll he'll go into like long, really fascinating monologues about like uh, uh, how he's like portraying the interior life of uh of all things including bacteria um and he was a he studied uh medicine i believe medicine and philosophy before becoming an artist and he co incorporates all these sort of ideas into his really unique performance art which i love and i, I don't know anybody else who does anything like it so i 
uh, I was really excited to to bring somebody like that to be on the show. That's amazing. I think I'm going to have to check him out. He sounds fun. Oh yeah, you got to Google him and and see the stuff that he does. Oh, he does sound amazing. Right. Um, I I have to ask about uh, the actual uh, the actual feel of the show, the atmosphere of the show, because you build an amazing atmosphere from one episode to the next. And I noticed a couple of the old uh, the old kind of horror tropes in there, like the uh, you know the tooth child in the window and things like that. <laughs> um, how difficult is it to build that kind of atmosphere? Um, it's just a matter of, of knowing what you're going for at the beginning and preparing and make sure that ma- ma- making sure that everybody understands the, the, the tone and voice of the show. And also a huge part of it is having one director for the entire season. So, uh, Craig McNeil did the entire Candle Cove season. I hired him because, and sought him out because his film, The Boy, had such a, strong voice and it, it seemed like the perfect uh the perfect you know resume film for what we were looking for it involves kids it's set in the 80s um it's very restrained it's beautifully composed um and uh and so Craig brought a great visual sensibility and a great sense of dread to the season um and and I always wanted the show to be for every season to be a showcase for a really interesting new director. So um, having one director across all six episodes allows for a unity of tone and a consistent sense of dread. That's that's fantastic. It's one thing that really stood out for me when I was watching the episodes, and uh, I effectively marathoned the whole thing. I watched them back to nice. back. And I think that's the best way to do it. I'll be honest. That is the way to do it. You know, you don't lose that tension from one episode to the next. And I, I was, I was gripped. The atmosphere was superb. But one of the things that I think helped the atmosphere was it wasn't so much the lack of violence. It was the fact that it all happened kind of off screen Mm -hmm. or just out of shot. The show, it's about, it's about a fear of, um, of what's happening, you know, Behind your back, yeah. um, what's happening in the other room? I mean, that that sense of dread uh, is so much more. Uh, it has so much more longevity than a, a, a jolt, um, and especially in TV, where you have to go from episode to episode, week to week. In our case, six episodes. It it it's just more uh, productive and valuable to create a lingering sense of unease than it is to have a couple of cheap scares. Yeah, I'll be a, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of jump scares. Um Yeah, I mean, you know, when done right, they're like impressive, but but you can only get so many and you can't do it week after week on TV. Yeah. It just doesn't last. Um unfortunately for me, uh I kind of when I was uh, 8 or 9, uh, we were my family and I were uh Sitting in front of the TV, the lights were off, and my eldest brother, uh, we were watching Piranha of all the films, because mm. that was the thing during the 80s, you let your kids watch whatever they wanted. <laughs> and it got to the scene where the the uh, overweight gentleman has just fallen off the boat and is about to get eaten by the Piranha, and my brother caught me and shoved my face up against the TV while that was going on. <laughs> and I screamed and screamed and screamed, and since then... Jump scares never faze me. <laughs> ah, you might say he did you a favor. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's not a not really a a thing for me either. There's when I think of the great jump scares, there aren't too many. There's yeah. the one in Exorcist Three, which is probably my favorite. Um, there's one in Insidious that I really like, and, and I can't think of too many others where I've like really jolted. Yeah, um, but but. You know, the horror movies that really stick with me are the ones where I just feel off all the way through and, uh, and I feel uncomfortable. And then when I, when the movie's over and I'm walking around, I still feel a sense of like something's not right. Yeah. And one of the ones that gave me that feeling was, uh, the original version of The Eye. I've never seen that. Um, it's, it's very, very, it, it's a very, very, strange film because before she gets the transplant before she has the operation 
everything is normal. But after that, it's just it just seems like reality seems to just shift a little bit. Yeah, I I, I need to see that film. That's um that's one of that, that's on a list that I've got of uh of horror films that uh, that I must see. It, it's very good. The original version of uh, Dark Water as well. In fact, mm-hmm. quite a, quite a lot of uh quite a lot of uh Southeast Asian uh horror movies are very good. Train to Busan is amazing. Yeah, I love that. And uh um I have I because I've been in production or post for the last like almost 2 years, there's like a bunch of stuff, TV and film that I haven't seen. You know, the longer your show goes, the yeah. more behind you get on uh on pop culture, which is is a sad fact. Ah, uh, that's a shame. Um, there is one that has uh, recently been released uh, called "I Am a Hero." It's based on a long-running manga series, and their take on zombies is very interesting. I found. I'm a hero. I'm gonna write that down. Um, cool. So yeah, if you get a chance, watch it. Um, okay, Nick. Um, <laughs> I think that's a natural conclusion to this. So it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Uh, cool, man. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you too. Channel Zero. I I, I have to say it is uh, an amazing series. I am really looking forward to uh, to the second series. Um, I've got to say uh, I've watched Stranger Things and I prefer Channel Zero. Cool. I'm glad you like the show, man. I really appreciate it. It, it is it is superb. Um, everything from the cinematography, the acting, the dialogue, the uh, just. How you've put everything together and that, that, that atmosphere, the atmosphere is, is second to none. Stranger Things has yeah, that jarring sensibility. It can, it shifts a bit too much for me, but Channel Zero just builds and builds and builds. And I love the ending. I think that any other, I don't think I can imagine any other ending except that one. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We, uh, we planned it from the beginning. So, uh, uh, I'm glad you liked it. Seriously. Hats off to you, sir. It is, it is superb work. Much appreciated. Thank you so Take much. Take care. Thank you so much, Nick. <laughs>